Hello and welcome to PFF at Night. I'm Doug Kide. Joined as always by Ari Mayrov and Brad Spielberger. Let's get right into the biggest news of the day. The NFL has decided to appeal Sue L. Robinson's decision regarding Deshaun Watson's six-game suspension. This means that now the NFL will ultimately decide whether it's Roger Goodell or his designee, designee, um, assignee, there we go, assignee, uh, who, what the suspension for Deshaun Watson is going to be. Brad, I'm going to kick this off to you first, uh, because you're, you're the lawyer in the bunch here. What is the point in even having Sue L. Robinson as part of this process if now the NFL can appeal the decision and either Roger Goodell or who he decides to hear the appeal will ultimately decide this? It is a fair question. And it's something that I alluded to in our last show a little bit in that during the appeal process, you can't add new facts. You can't gather new evidence. So the 16 page document that Sue L Robinson did draft in her, let's call it a decision, you know, on the, the initial six game suspension, you have to stay within the four corners of that you know document and you can't go outside mm-hmm. of that. And, and, you know, she mentioned about public outcry and not letting the NFL respond to social media and, and narratives outside of just the facts of, you know, the actual case itself. So, you know, I also talked about how she kind of went ahead and kind of, you know, snuffed out some potential arguments or or made it more challenging if they were trying to say, well, we think it should be, you know, more egregious and and therefore the suspension should be longer. She could point to precedent that she already kind of talked about. Um, And and I think, you know, long answer short, they're going to have to essentially argue. We see all that. We understand all that. While this is a new process, that means it's also the precedent from prior cases should mean less because it's under a different construct. And so therefore, you know, we feel that a more severe suspension is not only warranted, but we're allowed to do it and there should be no issue with it. Uh, As you said, new facts cannot be presented. Uh, This is based on that 16-page document that Sue L. Robinson put out. And just a reminder, Sue L. Robinson decided that Watson violated three provisions of the personal conduct policy. That's number one, so sexual assault, number two, conduct that poses a genuine danger to the safety and well-being of another person, and three, conduct that undermines or puts at risk the integrity of the NFL. Ari, we waffled on this a little bit on Monday's show, whether or not it was in the best interest of the NFL to appeal this ruling. Are you surprised that this is what the NFL decided to do? Yeah, you know, it, it gets very tricky because, again, like I said on Monday, I believe that if it was one to four, they would for sure appeal. If it was eight or more, I think there's a way to wiggle out of it and say, we'll leave it alone. If it was five, six, or seven, I think the NFL would be stuck. The reality here is that the NFL, when they put together the CBA in 2020, they essentially left the loophole open where we are still the appeals court officer. Roger Goodell is still the appeals officer or his designee. So if it ever got to a point where we do not agree with the judge, it still comes back to us. So if they have that power, why would they not use that power? The way CBA negotiations work is essentially if we give up something, you have to give us something something back. So why would the NFL not use this power if they believe six games is not enough? And we know that one year, one full year suspension, what they were looking for. So six clearly fell very short of that. We actually learned the other day that the NFL had settlement talks with the NFLPA. The talks really stalled when the NFL wanted to do 12 games plus a $10 million fine, which is how much Deshaun Watson made last year, the NFLPA said no. At least that gives us a bit of an idea of where the NFL is thinking. But, you know, it will be very interesting to see what happens now because we have history here with other players like Ezekiel Elliott, like a Tom Brady, where the NFL had appeals. And if essentially the NFLPA would sue and it would go to court. And while all that is trying to be resolved, the player in those cases was playing on the field during the season. So could that be the case over here with Deshaun Watson? I think there's a good likelihood that if the NFL does raise the amount of games in a significant amount, the NFL K will sue and Deshaun Watson could potentially be playing to start the season. Uh, I think that Ari raised a good point there with uh, the, with the settlement that the NFL uh, was, was trying to reach with Deshaun Watson, the NFL PA. And as he mentioned, that was uh, 12 games and $10 million Brad, I mean, if that's what they were offering in a settlement and if they wanted 
a full season suspension, it, you know, doesn't it, it doesn't it show their hand a little bit that what Roger Goodell or his designee decides here would probably be within that that range somewhere between a 12 game suspension to a full season suspension. It seems hard to believe that it would be below that 12 game suspension. Yeah, I would say the only counter argument might be that now they've seen the determination from Sue L. Robinson, perhaps it changes their position. I mean, it sounds like the NFLPA was pushing for zero games. And so maybe you could also argue, you know, they go further than 12 games and $10 million because that was their offer to someone looking for zero. And now that party is starting at six. They said they were not going to appeal, obviously asked the NFL to not appeal as well, which of course they ignored. Um, Yeah, I mean, I see the logic there, but, you know, I really do think at this point they can push it however they want. To. It's more just a question of, you know, are you inviting a potential federal lawsuit? And maybe in their minds, you are regardless because it's more of a procedural issue than a number of games and size of fine issue, I would I would imagine. Um, so, it, you know, if that's their opinion, that hey, look, we're going to get sued regardless, then they might as well go to the full extent that they truly did want from the beginning. Yeah, it seems hard to imagine a scenario where this doesn't get to federal court at this point, because obviously the NFL is appealing. They're not going to lessen the suspension. Uh, It does feel like it's probably going to be significantly now more than six games. And the NFL PA would have the right to then, you know, take this to federal court and say, this is what a, a neutral judge decided. Let's figure out some sort of common ground here once again. So I don't know. Uh, I think that, you know, Everyone's basically said on Twitter, this isn't going away anytime soon. Uh, The NFL has decided to drag this out further, which you can kind of understand based on the fact that they wanted this to be a full season suspension. What they were offering was 12 games and $10 million. What came down was six games. That clearly was not enough for Roger Goodell and the NFL. So now we'll be up to Roger Goodell or who he uh, assigns here to hear the appeal. Um, The NFL has said that that's a, a final verdict, but you know, that's a final verdict until it goes to court. So um, Aria, I guess I'll kick this, kick this to you first. Any final thoughts on this? Yeah. I mean, you know, the NFL put this whole thing into place and essentially ignored Sue Robinson's decision. So you probably wonder why would this be put in place uh, in the first place? But, um, you know, I think the NFL here has a chance to reset the whole personal conduct policy suspensions moving forward. Obviously, we've seen uh, people who gamble or PEDs get even more severe suspension than what Deshaun Watson got here. They have a chance here to reset the whole thing after years of it being such a problematic thing by going up, putting a higher number here. And the NFL usually prevails in court. We've seen it over and over again. It does take some time, but ultimately, they are the ones who prevail and end up winning. So, there's a scenario here where the NFL could just reset the entire personal conduct policy and make it the most severe punishment out of everything else from all the other policies in the NFL. And Brad, do you have any final thoughts on, on the appeal by the NFL? I, I think it's a great point because also you're kind of resetting the entire system again, where if you let this go and let it just be a six game suspension, then what scenario in the future that's, I mean, no, again, it's only four cases in this case, but nevertheless, what situation is going to be worse than what we deal, dealt with with Deshaun Watson? And so you're kind of anchoring to that six games is essentially the maximum punishment um, unless there's, you know, clear violence. And of course, we discussed what that term means and how it was used in Sue Robinson's opinion. But nevertheless, I think it's a great point to mention that you can argue they almost have to do this because otherwise then they're really stuck going forward. Yeah. At this point, you do have to set a new precedent for what the suspension will be uh, so that, you know, that neutral arbitrator, whether it's Sula Robinson or someone else can't refer back to precedent that was set when these, uh, when this punishment was uh, probably a little bit too far lessened. Let's get into more NFL non on field drama. That is the Miami dolphins were punished for tampering with quarterback Tom Brady dating back to, I believe it was December 2019. Also head coach Sean Payton dating back to, I think it was December uh, 2021. Uh, The Dolphins were basically, have been in contact with Tom Brady dating back to 2019, uh, trying to get him to be their quarterback, trying to get him to join their front office. And they were also in contact with Sean Payton, trying to get them, uh, get him to be their head coach. The NFL NFL did not find that the Dolphins had thrown games. Uh, it seems like there was at least some proof that uh, their their owner uh, Stephen Ross had joked about 
throwing games, had also, uh, you know, said that he would prefer to have a better draft pick than to win games. I think what this ultimately came down to was that Brian Flores and members of the Dolphin staff were not willing to act on those ideas. Uh, and that did save the Dolphins a little bit as far as uh, throwing games go. Uh, but as I said, they were uh, punished for tampering. It was a 2023 first round pick, 2024 third round pick. Stephen Ross suspended through October 17th. Uh, he was also fined one and a half million dollars. And um, there was also some other punishment that went along with this as well. So Brad, what was your initial uh, you know, reaction to this news that the Dolphins were punished for uh, what really came out initially uh, was a report during, I think it was the Senior Bowl. That's when Brian Flores decided to sue the NFL. And then some more information has leaked out about this uh, past that point as well. Yeah, I think it's interesting that we hear about tampering a lot in other sports leagues. I feel like in the NBA, it's almost commonplace at this point. I think the 76ers and the New York Knicks were levied fines this offseason for tampering, and they pay the fine and kind of move on. Um, I mean, this is this is a huge punishment, and I do think – uh, to be honest, that I think they essentially couched w one major punishment and the first and third round pick is a punishment both for the tampering and in reality for these comments made by owner Stephen Ross. Uh, to me, I think it is a little bit insulting that Brian Flores had contemporaneous notes at the time that outlined that he took the comments seriously and did not think they were jokes. Obviously, they have, you know, uncovered some evidence that they, he was joking, which I, I frankly don't understand, you know, how they can, you know, a couple of years later make that determination. So, in my opinion, this is a punishment for both activities, but it is crazy. The New, York, New England Patriots, and obviously, Doug, you can expand on this a bit, they've gotten punished all the time for all various different things, and a team in their own division was trying to steal their quarterback in the midst of a push for another Super Bowl ring. Um, just a crazy, crazy thing to do in the middle of a season. Um, um, you know, well before pre, uh, the offseason began. And then obviously with Sean Payton as well uh, down in New Orleans. So I do. Long story short, I, I think that the punishment was kind of both things folded together. Um, it was a bit unfortunate that Flores, they kind of rejected his claims, even though they did agree his allegations were legitimate. Yeah, and I think that, you know, just the tampering with Sean Payton, um, that alone, I think that Brian Flores has a case in his lawsuit that, okay, the Dolphins were talking to Sean Payton while I was still the head coach at this point. Uh, so there was certainly a lot of validity to his claims. I didn't love the statement that Sean, Stephen Ross put out, you know, saying that everything that Brian Flores said was defamatory or whatever the, the statement was, um, you know, rejecting everything that he had accused the Dolphins of doing. Uh, but I, you know, you mentioned the New England Patriots. It's obviously very interesting that all of this seems to have been set off by the text that Bill Belichick sent to Brian Flores, accidentally congratulating him on landing the New York Giants job when he was intending to text uh, Brian Dable, congratulating him for landing the, the New York Giants head coaching job. And then that seems to have been what really set off this decision by Brian Flores to sue the NFL and for a lot of this other information to come out. So uh, I'm not sure how forward thinking Bill Belichick was in sending that text to Brian Flores accident, accidentally or not, uh, but it, it worked out for him somewhat because a divisional rival lost a first round pick in 2023 and a third round pick in 2024. And that first round pick next year could be pretty important for the Miami Dolphins if Tua Tongo Vailoa doesn't work out for them this season, because they also have the 49ers first round pick, they very easily could have maneuvered around the draft board to get a quarterback if they need one next year. Now that becomes a lot more difficult. So Ari, what's been your reaction to all of this? Yeah, I mean, it's it's really fascinating when you think back. I mean, I know they had talks when he was still with the Patriots, but really just thinking about it from this offseason perspective, when Tom Brady retired after the divisional round, that was not really a retirement for football. It was really a retirement from the Tampa Bay Buccaneers with hopes of eventually ending up with the Miami Dolphins. And it all blew up because of the Brian Flores lawsuit. But what I think is, is also very noteworthy here is that Bruce Beal, who is the other person mentioned in all of this, he is a very high-ranking executive with the Dolphins and is basically the next man up if Stephen Ross ever decides to sell. He has the rights to buy it first. 
he's the one who's really been playing the biggest role in all of this because he's close friends with Brady. His wife is close friends with Brady's wife. And he's the one who's been trying to get Tom Brady to Miami throughout all these years. And I thought the punishment on him wasn't that severe because the NFL could have came down much harder on him as well to the point of where they take away his rights to buy the team whenever Stephen Ross decides to sell. They could have done something way more excessive because really Stephen Ross is the owner, yes, but he was the one really pushing all the buttons in the back and they really didn't do much to him. But um, it, it is a fascinating story. The NFL came down hard on the Miami Dolphins. One more thing I will add, I think the NFL, and I think Brad mentioned this, they combined the tampering and the tanking together because I really think that there were some clear tanking stuff going on with Steven Ross. I mean, it's hard to say that, oh yeah, I was joking about the idea of $100,000 per loss, but he said it, you know what I mean? So I think they combined both of these together to try to have the headline be the tampering while the tanking kind of took to the side and not many people are talking about that. Uh, you know, th- another interesting aspect of this is that despite the fact that they were tampering with Tom Brady dating back to 2019, Tom Brady did not join the Miami Dolphins. He joined the Tampa Bay Buccaneers that offseason. Uh, we were all kind of talking about this a little bit earlier. Buccaneers were certainly in a better position to succeed in 2020. We obviously saw that uh, by them winning a Super Bowl. The Miami Dolphins were had a, a, a pretty much, you know, bottom of the NFL roster in 2019. And I don't think that they were set up for success really for the next two seasons, but the Miami Dolphins are considerably better. Now uh, they've built up their roster. They've got Tyreek Hill. They've got Jalen Waddle. Um, they've got Mike McDaniel as head coach. Tom Brady is a free agent after this season. I mean, it, I, it would be the ultimate end to all of this drama, but you know, it's not out of the realm of possibility if Tom Brady is still one of the best quarterbacks in the NFL that he could still land with the Miami Dolphins. And then I guess it wouldn't really matter that they had to give up that first round pick. Uh, clearly they would still prefer to have it, but they wouldn't have to use that to get a quarterback in the short term um, if Tom Brady still does want to come there. So that's just another fascinating aspect of this. Uh, Ari, any final thoughts on this? Yeah, I'll just say one more thing. Um, the the, um, the Buccaneers and the Dolphins are going to have joint practices coming up next week. I'm just wondering if this becomes a bit of a distraction in Miami because this thing basically announces to the team, Mike McDaniel and Tua, you guys were our option number two this offseason, but here you guys are now. So I just wonder how much of this does become a distraction where, you know, we kind of wanted Tom and Sean, but we settled with you guys, but we'll see what happens next offseason because both those guys will be available, like we just said, Doug. So there is some pressure on them to perform this year for it not to get to that point. Also, one one final interesting scheduling quirk as well. The first game back for owner Stephen Ross is when the Pittsburgh Steelers with Brian Flores on the defensive coaching staff are in town. So there will be a fun narrative leading into that Dolphins-Steelers game as well. Uh, There's also some other news, obviously, around the NFL. Uh, You know, pretty brutal news from the Denver Broncos yesterday when Tim Patrick tore his ACL during training camp. Uh, the, The Broncos had one of the best, you know, offensive weaponry cores in the NFL with Jerry Judy, Cortland Sutton, Tim Patrick, uh, Javante Williams, Melvin Gordon, uh, Albert O there at tight end with Russell Wilson throwing the ball to them. So, I mean, I certainly think that the Broncos are still going to be contenders, but it certainly uh, weakens that offensive core a little bit there in Denver. Uh, Brad, what was your initial reaction to the Tim Patrick news? Yeah, like you said, they do have depth, but you look at a guy like KJ Hamler trying to get back and be healthy, a former second round pick. Jerry Judy's had some, you know, nicks and bruises along the way as well. Obviously, Court and Sutton tore his ACL in 2019. So extremely unfortunate for Tim Patrick. Good for him that he got that early extension on a three-year, $30 million deal. Well-deserved for an undrafted free agent. And of course, you know, matters a ton now. It is a bit of a knock and not to, you know, go down a, a whole well, but Russell Wilson's always been a guy pushed for Antonio Brown. Uh, he seems a little busy on a, on a music tour, but maybe they explore, you know, some of those guys out there. I know everyone brings up Odell Beckham Jr. whenever they can. Um, but yeah, maybe they look into adding a veteran now that Tim Patrick will not be there for the year. Antonio Brown, I had not even thought about that. But yeah, Ch- KJ Hamler certainly getting uh, more healthy now at this point. I believe that he was removed from the pup list. Uh, so Ari, what do you think happens here in Denver now? 
No, it's going to be interesting what they do. I mean, we did mention that they have some good receivers there anyways. KJ Handler, as we mentioned, is coming back from his own torn ACL. But Patrick really has just blossomed to such a great player. As Brad mentioned, the former undrafted free agent to have 50-plus receptions last year and over 700 yards. I think he graded over 70 here at PFF and got that extension. I believe it was in mid-November last year. And I think they had some really high hopes for him this year with Russell Wilson. I think as soon as that Russell Wilson trade happened, Judy Sutton and Tim Patrick all immediately went down and started working out with Russell Wilson. I think that was in early February and March. So they've been, you know, growing that rhythm together up until now. It's obviously really hurts. Third straight year, the Broncos had a torn ACL to one of their wide receivers early in the early um, in training camp or week one and two. It was Corlin Sutton two years ago, Hamler last year, and now Tim Patrick. So um, brutal injury luck in Denver. I think that you certainly rise up. Jerry Judy and Cortland Sutton in the the old fantasy rankings after this, because those will clearly be Russell Wilson's top two options in that offense. Tim Patrick certainly would have been involved in that as well if he hadn't injured his knee. Uh, Arizona Cardinals reached an extension with DJ Humphreys, their starting left tackle. Brad, what can you tell us about the money aspect of that deal? Yeah, so it was reported as a three-year, $66.8 million extension, which would make him the third highest paid tackle in football. He would surpass Laramie Tunsil in Houston as a guy on a three-year, $66 million extension. I will say this, though. There has been no reports since the report last night, and a small part of me is wondering if it's actually the, the, the three new years plus his current remaining year all four totals $66.8 million. It would mean the new deal is about $51.8 million over three years, which is about a $17 million per year extension. Would put him in that second tier of tackles with guys like Garrett Bowles and, and Colton Miller you know, out, out in, in Las Vegas. So I don't know that for a fact. I have not seen the details yet, but – he, I, I'm not sure he is the third highest paid left tackle in football talent. He did earn an 88 plus grade in 2020 kind of fell off a bit last year with a 67 grade. So came back down to earth he is a good former first round pick player. Um, but I do think we need to see a little bit more details there to know exactly what the situation is in Arizona. Yeah. All right. Were you surprised at all that uh, the Cardinals extended DJ Humphreys when they did? No, I mean, obviously whenever you have building blocks in the roster, especially now with this, big quarterback contract as well. You look to lock up those pieces for the long term. And he is one of the few good draft picks that Arizona's GM has had there um, throughout his um, tenure there with the Cardinals and Steve Kime. So, you know, obviously locking him up, locking up with one year left. I believe the reason why we haven't gotten that many details on this is because Humphrey's actually didn't deal with our agent. He did it himself. So um, I think the only way we actually finally get these details is once it officially goes into the NFL system, and I'm sure somebody will get their hands on that. Well, let's talk about Odell Beckham Jr. Brad, you mentioned him earlier. I find it <laughs> truly fascinating that Sean McVay keeps bringing up Odell Beckham Jr. completely on his own. After Van Jefferson uh, suffered a knee injury during training camp, he's only going to be out for a few weeks. But Sean McVay was basically like, yeah, and then, you know, we'll get Odell Beckham Jr. back here whenever he decides to sign. It's like, I, I feel like, I mean, obviously it's it's some degree of trolling since he's he's smiling when he's saying this. He's kind of joking around. But at the same time, I, I mean, I don't know if he would be saying this if it wasn't a real legitimate possibility that Odell Beckham Jr. would be coming back. I, I personally talked to a, a source close to Odell Beckham Jr. And he said that, you know, Beckham is, is as strong as he's ever seen him as big as he's ever seen him. I saw pictures posted recently by Odell Beckham Jr. Where he looks like David Boston, he looks jacked. Um, so it seems like he's certainly working on his body while rehabbing that knee injury. And uh, I was also told that he's you know ahead of schedule on the knee, which is certainly a good sign since Beckham uh, did, you know, injure that knee during, the Super Bowl. It's unclear on the timeline of the torn ACL since Odell Beckham Jr. said they tore it before the Super Bowl, but regardless, there was an injury at the Super Bowl surgery afterwards. Uh, so a good sign that he's ahead of schedule. But Brad, what do you make of, of Sean McVay's uh, constant comments about Odell Beckham Jr.? Yeah, when we talked a little about tampering earlier, I guess because he is an unrestricted free agent, it's yeah. not tampering. But um, he almost co comes across like a like a former girlfriend that he's trying to you know negotiate by the media. It's like Drake talking about Rihanna or something. Um, just trying to you know hope she sees the clip and, and maybe thinks of him a little bit. Um, yeah, no, it's interesting. I mean, he obviously 
He mentioned that he crashed his wedding. I think for Odell Beckham to do that, it, you know, it gives him a little bit of leeway. You know, if you crash my wedding, I can make a couple of comments or a couple of jokes about you. I think that's only fair. But, you know, at the same time, it is it is working a little bit in Odell Beckham Jr.'s favor. There have been injuries really at all positions, but there have already been, a, unfortunately, a lot of injuries across the NFL early in camp. We obviously just talked about Tim Patrick. Um, so, you know, that's always going to happen. I think players do realize that they can wait things out sometimes because of that. And it's already seems to work a little bit in his favor. He has some options available to him. Um, but obviously the Rams think that at the end of the day, they're going to get him back in the building. Van Jefferson also just had a knee surgery out in LA is supposed to be back at some point this season, if not before week one. But of course you don't know. And, and Odell can slide right in and, and return to the, to the ramps. Are, are there any other teams that you're monitoring out there for, for OBJ services? Yeah, I mean, I, I've said this before. I mean, maybe the reason why Sean McVay is kind of pushing all of this is because he might realize right now that Odell might take this into the season. If that happens, as Brad said, unfortunately, injuries do happen. We had one of James Washington in Dallas as well. But besides for all of that, we'll have the season start. We'll have the season start. And by that happening, we'll see these teams, which teams do need help, which teams um, are weak at the wide receiver position. I mean, you can look around the NFL right now. The last year it was Green Bay that was looking to get Odell in for agency along with the Rams. He picked the Rams. They don't have Devontae Adams anymore. That would make sense. You can look at a team like the Saints, his old friend or his current, his always friend, Jarvis Lang. Injury as always is, is there right now. Maybe go over there and have uh, the LSU band you know, even bigger. Um, he's always wanted to be with Bill Belichick or Tom Brady. Whatever it is, let the season start and let the options come to me because you can make a serious argument that the Rams don't really need Odell Beckham Jr. So if he doesn't sign before the regular season, I could see that be the route that Odell is taking. Yeah, I mean, if it was a longer term injury with Van Jefferson, I think it would make a ton of sense for him to go to L.A. But clearly, clearly they do still have Cooper Cup. Um, they've got Allen Robinson. And then if Van Jefferson can come back, you know, somewhere around week one, then it's not necessarily a necessity to get OBJ in there. Let's do a quick training camp wraparound. I was back at Patriots training camp today and uh, Nelson Aguilar has actually been a player that's been you know, catching my eye a little bit out there. Seems like he's acclimating better this summer than what we saw last year. So I actually reached out to a source about it. And one person said that, you know, they've the Patriots have changed their offense schematically a little bit this off season. And he thinks that that's kind of precipitated that jump, not just from Nelson Aguilar, but from John U. Smith as well. So certainly possible the Patriots could get some returns on two guys that they spent a lot of money on in free agency. I kind of shot back to that, that, that source, I don't understand how the Patriots are going to get all this, these guys on the field because they've got Kendrick Bourne, Jacoby Myers, Devontae Parker, and Nelson Aguilar at wide receiver. They've got Johnny Smith and Hunter Henry at tight end. They just drafted Tyquan Thornton, who's also impressing in camp at wide receiver. They've got Ramondre Stevenson, Damian Harris, uh, James White at running back. You can only get five guys on the field at once. And he basically said, you know what? I'm interested to see that too, because I don't think that any determinations have been made yet at this point. So a lot of guys who have to get fed in New England, not a lot of stars in that mix, but certainly a lot of starting capable players. Brad, anything in training camp that you're monitoring right now? Yeah, I guess it's cheating a little bit, but there was some news that came out while we were recording, and I think it's pretty fascinating, is Anthony Barr, the longtime Minnesota Vikings linebacker, joining the Dallas Cowboys. As you mentioned, there's been some injuries on in the offense there. Um, Jabril Cox, their fourth-round pick last year, is coming off an injury as well. I think what's really fascinating about Barr going to the Cowboys is that He's kind of one of the players closest to a Micah Parsons from a when he came out in college, he kind of had that, you know, off ball linebacker, but also edge rushing capability, played Sam in Minnesota, did rush the passer on passing downs, also has the ability to cover a little bit and drop back. And so they're kind of similar in the, you know, obviously I'm not saying he's the same player now, um, or maybe he reached the peak that some people expect Micah Parsons to reach, but has that kind of versatility and that and that tweener ability. I think it's a very interesting addition for them. And and they're bolstering that linebacker group. They brought back Leighton Van Der Esch. Um, like I mentioned, they have some young guys in the fold as well. So potentially a big addition for that defense down in Dallas. In June, I wrote a, uh, you know, every team in the NFL should wait, make this one more move. Uh, I crossed another one off the list because I had, I had Anthony Barr to the Cowboys on that one. So I think I'm like, like four for four or five, for, something like that at this point on that article. But uh, are right, anything else from camp that you're monitoring? 
Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because Trevor Penning, the Saints' first round pick, got kicked out of practice today for fighting. It's his third straight day that he's had a skirmish on the field of a defensive player. And we know that he's a bit feisty. I think we saw some of that at the Senior Bowl, but now it's carrying over to training camp with his own teammates. I just remember one time hearing from a coach that whenever an oppo- opposing team knows there's a player that you could put some buttons and get him angry that eventually you could do something and get him ejected from the game. So this keeps on happening in training camp. I wonder if some teams are going to try to push some buttons with Penning during the season, try to get him out of the game, because, you know, it's clear that now three straight days he's had a problem with the Saints, and now uh, he got basically thrown out of practice today because it escalated to a different level today. So um, it's obviously something that we'll keep an eye on moving forward, but three straight days is, um, is quite wild. Yeah, I remember I was listening to the Chris Long podcast. They had Steve Belichick on there. And Chris Long was basically saying that, you know, sometimes guys fight in practice because they don't want to practice anymore. It's an easy way to, to get kicked off the field. Then you kind of get out of the heat. Not saying that's what Trevor Penning's doing, but uh, if you don't like practicing, it's pretty pretty good way to get tossed off the field is to start a fight out. Brad, you have one more thing to add? Yeah, I know we're trying to wrap up here, but I had to mention, because you mentioned the Saints, I think something of interest, also a guy that probably loves to fight in practice and try Chauncey Gardner-Johnson um, infamously fought Michael Thomas back in the day, but he is apparently not fully participating in all their activities, is looking for an extension, heading into his fourth and final season of his rookie deal. Uh, I wrote an article a couple months ago about an early extension, what that looks like for him, so go check that out on PFF.com, but very much so deserving, a great slot defender, can play some safety as well, uh, apparently you know, looking for that deal before the season kicks off. Well, we've talked a lot, probably too much on this show, about how tight end deals are far behind the rest in the NFL slot cornerback deals or that, that nickel defensive back that is even further behind tight ends. I think who's the highest paid slot right now. Is it still Kenny Moore? It, you know, Justin Coleman got cut Avante Maddox and those guys got about eight and a half million, but nevertheless, there's no one making even 10 million a year as a, as a yeah. true slot cornerback. Yeah. And, and slot cornerbacks are, you know, at this point, team's base is nickel. They're just as important as any other starter out there on the field. And if you can really lock down a slot wide receiver and you're seeing, I mean, Cooper Cup is one of the best wide receivers in the NFL and he's a slot wide receiver. So the guy who's defending him, pretty important. I think that uh, NFL teams should probably start prioritizing those defenders and get some of their best players there in the slot. But that will do it. For today's PFF at night, you can keep it on pff.com for all of your news and analysis. Follow Ari on Twitter at my sports update. Follow Brad on Twitter at PFF Brad. Follow me on Twitter at Doug Kide. And we will be back with you guys again on Monday, unless something seriously crazy happens over the next two days, which is at this point uh, certainly possible in the NFL.